Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to be here. In fact, I'm not only honored, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed to be on stage with such, with such great people. So uh, bear with me today. I'm keenly aware, I believe, I am the last presenter on the last session of the last day. So I will do my best to uh, keep it high level and brief. Um, thank you again for having me. Uh, it's a little awkward. I'm a, I'm a technical guy by, by trade, but I'm talking about the market. So unlike most, if not all of the speakers, I'm not afraid to bring some notes with me. So I've done that. Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, our take on the uh, the market uh, at large. So um, first thing I'll do is uh, offer our forward-looking statement. Um, a lot of words here, but what it basically says is that a lot of what I'm talking about today, uh, by definition, requires me to be, be a bit of an oracle. So I'll do my best to talk about the uh, the next 10 years as it relates to Tabby. Uh, but obviously, a lot of what I'll say will will probably be wrong. So we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, from a topic and question perspective, uh, I was asked to consider the following three items as part of my presentation today. So we'll talk about where the overall, overall market is uh, headed for the treatment of aortic stenosis. Uh, we'll take a shot at talking about what percentage of aortic disease will be treated by transcatheter approach uh, in 2020, and then ultimately wrap up with some factors on what will impact the growth of aortic transcatheter procedures. So I suppose a talk like this uh, is best grounded with one of the basic facts, and that is, as a, as a worldwide population, we are aging and aging rapidly. Uh, our data suggests that the uh, population from 2010 to 2020, as you see noted here, will grow from 8.4% to 11.5% uh, in the category greater than or equal to 65 years of age. Uh, so that's a pretty significant uh, uptick. And when you combine that with the fact that we know, based on a number of data points, uh, including the fact that the uh, prevalence of valve disease as proven by the Olmsted County data uh, here uh, shown is that the, the incidence of mitral disease, the incidence of total uh, valve disease, and the incidence of aortic disease circled here and looked at as a function of age obviously begins to trend up uh, once you hit 65. So whether you look at it as a prevalence data point or an incidence data point, the, uh, the trend between valve disease uh, incidence and age is real. And as such, uh, as we grow older, we get sicker. So let's, to let's take a look at uh, total worldwide AVR procedures. Um, you're going to see today that our projections uh, for not only AVR procedures, but as we narrow into the TAVI segment, are uh, a little bit different than what you see from groups like the Millennium Group. With all due respect, I think we're not as, uh, quite as aggressive as they are with respect to TAVI uptick. But certainly, the, uh, the news for AVR is good. Um, so the total amount of AVR procedures from 2010 to 2020 grows at a rate of about 5.5%. Uh, TAVI actually grows in that same period over 20% uh, as a total of total AVR procedures. So not only is uh, TAVI uh, growing very popular in terms of what's going on, but obviously the, uh, the amount of TAVI is, uh, is growing as well. This is a pretty basic slide, um, but we have to remind ourselves that not all aortic valve uh, disease sets are obviously AS. Uh, the pr uh, predominance of it is AS. Uh, a good chunk of it is AR as well. We use the 80-20 rule. Uh, if you look at the citations, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty well substantiated. Uh, so the amount of uh, AS as a total uh, piece of the aortic valve disease pie is, uh, is significant. So then you look at total surgical aortic valve replacement procedures. And uh, isolated a AVR is about half of that. Uh, this is obviously, as I, I believe Dr. Smith mentioned, this is where a lot of the opportunity is today and where TAVI is uh, currently located and a part of, but the uh, concomitant procedures, as noted here, which is the other half, is obviously of great interest as well. Uh, that comes with complications that the uh, previous presenters noted, so I won't talk about that here, but certainly it's a big piece of it. Now if we break it down by geography, so I talked a little bit about this data already. Uh, the total uh, AVR is growing again about 5.2% 5, 5 over the next decade. TAVI is about 23% by our total estimates, compound annual growth rate. Um, we estimate that the U.S. is about 20% of that. Uh, during that time period, EMEAC in those geographies is almost half. Uh, what drags the total down for TAVI is rest of world because the adoption rate uh, is not as, as significant. And we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, if you look at it by 2020, we expect the adoption rate in Europe of TAVI to be well in excess of 40%. In the U.S., we expect to be approaching 40%. In the rest of the world, we actually expect it to still be less than 6%. So this 
is the total worldwide look at treatment of AS. And so obviously our data uh, in terms of where we think we're exiting this year from a TAVI perspective as a total percentage of surgical AVR uh, is much different than what you'll see a lot of the analysts who are a lot more bullish. Uh, we think this is pretty realistic. We've, we've looked at a number of sources which are listed here. Uh, we think TAVI is approaching 10% at the end of the year again for the total world. Uh, we think by 2020 it'll obviously be approaching 30%. And the key there again is the fact that the rest of world uptake is considerably smaller than what you see in EMIAC in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, Professor Falk talked about this data already. Uh, this data is a little bit different than what was presented earlier, but certainly the German uh, experience is a very interesting one. Uh, I think rather than focus too much on how many AVR procedures were done with TAVI at the end of 2010, we cite 14%. I think there's been higher numbers quoted earlier. This total growth rate on a procedural basis in Germany for TAVI was actually a 65% increase from 2009 to 2010. So uh, that model is a very interesting one, uh, but yet still very unique uh, relative to the, uh, the rest of the world experience today. <clears throat> this is always a great slide to get people fired up. So the, uh, the question comes down to, well, what is the role of the surgeon and uh, what, will, uh, what will happen in terms of transfemoral versus transapical versus other? Uh, this is one view of that. I think the um, reality of the situation is that we don't know. Uh, but I think today, this is what we estimate, you know, about a 70-30 split between transfemoral and transapical, about 80-20 by 2020. But obviously, there's a lot of things that can impact those numbers. So in concluding, what are some of the factors that impact market expansion? I think a lot of these have been talked about. Uh, things like stroke rate, uh, vascular complication rates were talked about in the previous presentation. Uh, ultimately, trials that were designed to collect data on uh, younger and lower risk patients. Uh, a lot of market dynamics, these are obviously coming into play now, and there's been a lot of discussion about these throughout. Price reimbursement, restrictions on centers, et cetera. And then on the technology side, um, valve durability has been discussed. Smaller delivery devices have been discussed. Uh, ultimately, strong industry investment on a lot of different levels have been discussed. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you.